Let me begin by, uh, I, I, I went around, uh, I, didn't, I didn't get around to the groups uh, during your discussions uh, today, but yesterday I, I came to three of the four, or where are there five? I came to three anyway, out of how many there were. And uh, it, was, it was quite interesting, they, each, each group was, was rather different. Uh, and that's, that's often the case, uh, you know, it depends very much on on people's experience, uh, it depends very much. Uh, well, so on the numbers of people in these two groups were quite different, uh, and the approaches they took. Uh, in one of the groups, I think it was group two. Was that group two? It was. Um, I got a full report. And uh, the, thing that, the thing that struck me, and, and it's something I, uh, I was interested to, to talk a bit about, uh, there were people who looked at these texts that I had given you, these, this first section of, on praise of God, and uh, there were clearly people who saw the glass half full, and others who saw the glass half empty. Uh, and that, that is, is characteristic of the, of the way we tend to approach these things. Of course, uh, I only gave you some snippets of the Quran. I didn't, I didn't give you the whole thing. And uh, there were some people who in their approach to it said, oh yes, I recognize that, I, I respond to that, I find I can resonate with that. They were looking at the full part. And there were other people who said, well, I don't find this and I don't find that and I don't find the other thing. Uh, and it may be a question of attitude, uh, but it certainly we, perhaps we need both of these both of these approaches. It's it's not sufficient really simply to say oh yes it's it's all the same. You know, here I see here I see oh there's a word I recognise there's an idea I recognise yes isn't it all the same? At the same time. Uh, remembering what we, we said on the first evening, I think it was the first evening, about text, pretext, and context. We won't find everything in the text, because when people read the text, they bring a whole lot of other stuff to it, and they develop a whole lot of other stuff out of it. People often say of the Quran, well, the Quran says of itself, uh, God says in the Quran, if all the oceans of the world were ink and all the trees of the earth were made into pens and if you brought another six oceans uh, to help those existing oceans of ink that would not be enough to exhaust the words of your Lord. The word of God in whichever tradition you live is infinite. God is what God has to say for God's self is as unlimited as God is. And so no Muslim thinks that all God has to say is contained between the two covers of the Quran because the Quran won't allow her to believe that because the Quran says uh, more than once the, the inexhaustible nature of the Word of God, of the speaking of God. And uh, so many people will speak of the Quran as, as the surface, the part that appears, the so-called zahir, what, what you can see, the words, and the batin, batin, this is your batin. <laughs> You're learning a bit of Arabic here. Belly button, batin, the, the inner part. So the, the Qur'an, people would say, has a surface aspect and you can just read the surface aspect and some Muslims are very committed to reading only what's on the surface. It's a kind of minority position, but, but it's there. But for most Muslims, every word, even every letter, has a depth to it uh, which contains infinitely more than can appear on the surface. And that's very important to remember because we, we, can get, we can get stuck on the idea of the text and we can hold Muslims to the zahir. We can hold Muslims to the, 
just to the surface of the text. And we say, you have to believe it as it appears on the surface. Don't tell us that there's an infinite depth beneath that surface. Don't tell us that there are levels and layers uh, to this. It says here, this word appears, and it says that. Hardly any Muslim reads the Quran in that way. The Quran establishes a relationship with God, a relationship of judgment, of guidance. Uh, the Quran, which seems to have disappeared. <coughs> uh, the Quran establishes a relationship between God and the reciter. And in that relationship, the community of believers can go ahead confident that they are being guided by God, even when they go, on, go beyond the word of the text, even when they go beyond the surface meaning, because they are convinced uh, that God's intention is to guide towards the good, that God's intention uh, is to guide towards mercy, etc. So, Looking at the text as we did, just a little bit of it yesterday, uh, only gives you a small taste. But uh, one of the things that, that people commented on, and I've been asked uh, by people uh, during the breaks, uh, what about love? We talked about a lot about love this morning, of course, but uh, love in the Quran. The Quran does talk about love and how God loves the believers and how God loves those who are pious and God-fearing. It also says quite explicitly on a number of occasions, God doesn't like the people who exaggerate. God doesn't love the unbelievers. God doesn't love uh, the malefactors. It's, the Quran is quite clear on who God loves and who God doesn't love. But, uh, and some people, uh, read it in, in those terms. Now, if we, uh, a number of you have raised the question of what's currently going on in Iraq. And there are people who read the Quran there who are saying, God does not love these people. God does not approve of these people. These people must become Muslim. If they refuse to become Muslim, then they, they are unbelievers. And the Quran says, according to their reading of it, that they are, they are to be killed. They can escape being killed by accepting to be Muslim or by paying a tax. Now, that has, that has plenty, of, uh, uh, plenty of history to it. Uh, these are not the first people to have done that. And even the first, even the, the first Muslims who did it we're not the first people to have done that. At the time that Islam emerged, uh, Christians were doing the same thing, principally to Jews. Forced conversions, uh, even later, pogroms, the Crusaders, the, those great Christian Europeans who took upon themselves the sign of the cross and then went marauding across Europe killing Jews to start, and then passing through Constantinople and sacking that and killing Orthodox Christians before they got to Jerusalem and bathed the streets with blood and rejoiced over that. None of these, none of these things uh, represent the triumph of our faith. This is the problem. We, we look at the other person's reality and we say, well, that must be what their faith produces. That is the, the end point of their faith. That is, that is what their faith is aiming at. And Muslims, Muslims look at us the same way. They say, well, look at the US. You know, look, at the, look at all the arms trade. Look at all the, uh, all the things that are going on, the, the school shootings, the, um, the pornography, you know, the drug dealing, any number of things. And they say, well, that's what Christianity brings about. That's what Christian life is about, clearly. This is the great Christian country. We look at 
various Muslim countries and we say, well, that's what Islam is about too. That's, it's about violence, it's about lack of democracy and so on. These are, these are situations of sin. These are not the ideal to which either of these faiths is, is striving. And so, in one sense, a, a couple of you in, in questioning me, uh, or raising questions to me, have, have given me the sense that somehow I have to explain uh, what's happening in Iraq in terms of how this is Islamic. And I can't do that because I don't believe it is. Certainly the people who are doing it think they are being Muslim and according to their own lights, they are. But most of the Muslim world, uh, the International Union of, of Muslim Scholars, which is a very conservative group, much aligned with the Muslim brothers, they have condemned them. They say this has got nothing to do with Islam. This is, this is anarchy. Uh, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which is like the Muslim UN, has come out against it. Uh, Muslim leaders in, in Britain, the US, in any number of places. So most Muslims are saying, this is not what it's about. Uh, I can't explain it to you any better than, than to say that uh, this is what happens when we consider ourselves the creator when we put ourselves in the place of God. The, the term that was used yesterday when, when God was condemning uh, Iblis, and he says, get down out of here, there's no place here for you, no, no place here for your arrogance. And the word arrogance in, in Arabic is istikbar. Uh, it has that K-B-R in it, which is about greatness. And uh, one of, the, one of the things that, that is part of the Muslim call to prayer uh, is Allahu Akbar. God is great. God is greater. God is greater than anything you can imagine. Istikbar is considering yourself great. It's putting yourself at the level of God. That's what's wrong with that kind of arrogance. It's not just that it's arrogance, it's because of the, the word that's chosen, it's like saying, I am God. So to come back to our discussion of original sin, this is, this is what happens when people do not recognize that they are also creatures. When people do not recognize that they are bound into a unity with other human beings, that they have to um, exercise their shaping of the world in, in consonance, in resonance with God's shaping of the world, with, with God's uh, ongoing creation of the world. So there are, many, there are many issues one would want to point to, but I think the, the important thing is to say these are not the triumph of Islam, although many critics want to say, well, there you are, see, this is what happens. And critics on the other side would say, there you are, see, this is what happens. Pornography, drug dealing, etc., etc. So, to return again to, to uh, where we began on the first night, this is, this is a moment both for humility and for calling to humility. This is not a time in which we say, oh yeah, well, they're okay because we're not, we're not okay. They're okay, leave them to it. It's not okay what's going on. It's horrendous. It's, it's, it's hate-filled. Uh, but we cannot take the, the moral high ground because of our own history. Taking the moral high ground doesn't work. It only, it only makes dialogue impossible. This, this brings us slightly to, to uh, in relation to this question. Do Muslims have the Christian concept that we grow up and then are co-creators with God? Servants of compassion, but also friends of God. Two things I want to pick out of this question. One is the idea of a co-creator is a little bit problematic in, in the Islamic tradition because it's, again, it's like saying, I am 
somehow God's equal. And this is Tawheed, this is the affirmation that only God is really creator. And uh, if you remember the slide I had up there this morning, this is part of the biblical tradition. There is only one creator. Now at the same time, I think we, we recognize in, from our own experience that we have creativity. We are, we are able to shape the world in various ways. But human creativity is always going to be derivative. It's always going to be derived from God's creativity. The best of human creativity is, is the kind of, of creativity which channels God's dream for how the world might be. The best of human shaping of, of situations is a shaping which resonates with the way God would like to shape a particular situation, a particular relationship, a particular political situation. Uh, the way God would like to shape each of us, uh, the, the way God would like to shape our minds and our hearts in love and in fidelity and in space fidelity. So we're not co-creators in the sense that we are equal. It's not like having co-chairs of, uh, of a committee. We are not co-chairs with God on the creation committee. But we do exercise, I think, real creativity. And the Islamic tradition can live with that as, as long as we are not placing ourselves on, on a level with God. Uh, I think I mentioned the other day this, this, this question of uh, are we the creators of our own acts? Or is that too much? If, for example, okay, say I do that. Why did that bowl ring? Vibrations. Sorry? Vibrations. Vibration, okay. But the, the, question, the question in the, in the philosopher's mind is, did that bowl ring because I hit it? Or did the bowl ring because God wanted it to ring? <laughs> you know, it, it's, it sounds a funny question, but we, we've, we've uh, We've done this in the Western, Western philosophical tradition too, that whole question of causality. And are we the real causes of things? Or, uh, or do things, are things separate? My, my striking like that, that's one action. And the bell, the, the bowl ringing is another event. And both those events are events created by the one creator. Now in a sense everything that, that happens, everything that exists is part of the creation of the one creator. It's all grown out of the same, the same energy, the same forces. Uh, you know, think of the Big Bang. I mean, everything has come from there. Ultimately we're working it out. Uh, so the question, the question which remains unresolved in, in both our philosophical traditions is the extent to which we are really uh, free creators or whether, uh, to what extent we have to understand our creativity as being always within the framework of God's creativity. Now, there are lots of questions that follow on from that of theodicy and so on, but uh, I don't want to get into those. Uh, this, this other term that came in the question, uh, servants of compassion, but also friends of God. Friends of God is, is a key term in the, uh, in the Sufi tradition, in the Islamic spiritual tradition. Some people think of Sufism as a kind of separate little uh, compartment. Some people wouldn't even think of it as, as Islam. But this... I, th I think it's wrong, wrong to think of it that way. There, there's, a, there's an undercurrent of, of this spiritual practice and, and approach which runs right throughout the Islamic tradition. You know, the great philosophers and the great lawyers and the great Quran commentators uh, who are still read today and who are still so important in the Islamic tradition were also practitioners of Sufism. This was not a thing, oh, you're a lawyer, 
and he's a Sufi. You're a Quran commentator, and this one is a, is a spiritual master. No, the whole thing was part of the, the one reality. And if you, if you live in a Muslim country, and well, some places try to stamp this out, but uh, anywhere in, in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and so on, you know that there is this, there is this undercurrent uh, of spiritual practice, and the notion of friends of God is enormously important. The, the great Sufi saints are referred to as the awliya, the, the friends of God. Uh, they talk about the lovers of God. And there's a, uh, there's a huge, long tradition of enormous, enormous literary works of love poetry, love, love conversations with God, um, the so-called munajat, you know, these, these little colloquies with God, which you, might, you would call it in the Ignatian tradition, where the, the lover speaks. And uh, it's, it's very interesting because it actually, it undercuts one of, the, one of the major things we think of with regard to Islam. We think of, and some of you commented on, on this in your reading of, of the Quran text, it, it feels like it's master and servant. This is instructional. This is people giving orders. God is giving orders and you just do this. And certainly that element is there. The, the, the worshipper is the abd, the servant. Um, but Paul also calls himself a slave of Christ Jesus. You know, this, is, this is not something foreign to the Christian tradition. Paul can, can be utterly in love with Jesus and at the same time call himself the slave. This is his freedom, he says, to be enslaved to Christ Jesus. So it's a... Uh, it's a thing which, which runs through you know, love literature traditions all over, this, this notion of being enslaved to the beloved, uh, the tresses of the beloved have you entwined and bound up uh, in, in a lot of the Islamic um, poetical traditions. You have these things about you know, the beloved's eyelashes are like darts and they, uh, she shoots right through you. Uh, so that there's, a, there's an enormously long tradition of this, but wh what it does is, is this. You have certainly the master-servant uh, relationship in Islam, as we do in the Christian tradition. But you also have the lover and beloved tradition. And uh, many of the Sufis will take uh, a verse, I think it's chapter 5, verse 54, uh, if, if uh, those people who used to believe don't, mm, something like, if, if, uh, if they don't continue, God will bring a new people. Uh, he will love them and they will love him. It's a, it's a, a bit uh, reminiscent of, of something that you know, we have in the Old Testament, you shall be my people, I will be your God. Uh, the mutual love there. But the thing about lover and beloved, with, with master and servant, you know who's on top and who's, who's be below, who commands and who obeys. With lover and beloved, it's, it's back and forth. You know, there's the active, there's the passive, lover, beloved. So God is beloved, God is lover. Uh, the human person is lover. There's... there's a great deal of, uh, if you like, almost equality in it. And it, it's deliberately turning upside down the normal, uh, the normal way we think of these things. Let me read you a, a little piece. Ah, it's in my room, but I can find it here. Now, everybody lie down on the bench. <laughs> I'm going to read it to you. This is, uh, this is, the Conference of the Birds is the most wonderful 
book, and uh, I recommend to you this this version of it, the Penguin Penguin Classics translation by Afham Durbandi and uh, Dick Davis. Uh, it's by Fariduddin Attar. Uh, one of his quotations was given to us, I think, in that, in that first uh, PowerPoint we had on, on the first night. Uh, Attar writes one of these, it's about 4,000 lines long, this extended poem, all done in rhyming couplets. And uh, the idea is that the birds get together and they say, we want to, we need to have a king. Everybody else has a king, we don't have a king. Uh, and so eventually they go looking for their king. Uh, the hoopoe, the bird, tells them that we do have a king, it's called the Simurg, and he once passed close to earth in China and dropped a feather, and everyone has been desperately in love and seeking this king ever since. Uh, we can go there and search for the king, but we have to pass through all these valleys. The journey is long and arduous. And this is a manual of the spiritual life. But it, it's, it's such a wonderful poem. And, and the, the translation is so wonderful because it, it carries you along with it. It's translated into rhyming couplets. Whereas uh, most translations of it are in prose. And it's kind of stodgy. But uh, so uh, scattered throughout this poem, there are a number of stories. Uh, so you, you have at one level what's going on is the hoopoe teaching teaching the spiritual life to the other birds and dealing with their questions and their fears and their uh, reticence about going on the spiritual quest. And, and he drops in these various stories and they're stories about lovers and stories about uh, faithful people and unfaithful people and, and so on. And, and there's uh, about a dozen, I think, altogether stories of royal figures, kings, princesses, sultans, who fall in love, desperately, crazily in love with someone who's well beneath them. Uh, you have the, the, the lord who loves the beer seller. There's someone who sells beer and this, the lord, falls completely in love with him and he's, he spends all his money going to buy beer just so he can be near this one that he loves, who sells beer. Uh, you have a number of stories about uh, Mahmoud, Shah Mahmoud, who I think was uh, Mahmoud of Ghazna, uh, who was the, one of the conquerors of, uh, who first brought Muslim armies into India, into Sindh. And uh, Mahmoud has a slave called Ayaz, and Ayaz is, is the apple of Mahmoud's eye. And, and there are a number of, of stories about Mahmoud and Ayaz and the love. But let me read you this one. It's, it's short, but it, it gives you a taste of uh, what's going on here. Are you ready? <laughs> Ayaz, afflicted with the evil eye, fell ill. For safety, he was forced to lie, sequestered from the court in loneliness. The king who loved him heard of his distress and called the servant. Tell Ayaz, he said, what tears of sympathy I daily shed. Tell him that I endure his suffering. I hardly comprehend that I am the king. My soul is with him, though my flesh is here, and guards his bed solicitous with fear. Ayaz, what could this evil eye not do if it destroys such loveliness as you? The king was silent. Then again he spoke, go quickly as fire, return like smoke, stop nowhere, but outrun the brilliant flash that lights the world before the thunders crash. Go now, if you so much as pause for breath, my anger will pursue you after death. The servant scuttled off, consumed with dread, and like the wind, arrived at Ayaz's bed. There sat his sovereign by the patient's head. Aghast, the servant trembled for his life and pictured in his mind the blood-smeared knife. My king, he said, I swear, I swear indeed that I have hurried here with utmost speed. Although I see you here, I, I cannot see how in the world you have preceded me. Believe in my innocence, and if I lie, I am a heathen and deserve to die. His sovereign answered him, 
You could not know the hidden ways by which we lovers go. I cannot bear my life without his face, and every minute I am in this place. The passing world outside is unaware of mysteries Ayaz and Mahmoud share. In public, I ask after him, although behind the veil of secrecy I know whatever news my messengers could give. I hide my secret and in secret live. That's just one of them, and uh, it's, a, it's a short one, so I thought uh, I could read it to you. You, you have this, this reversal, the, you know, the, the powerful figure, the king, in love with the slave. Gender doesn't come into these things, we're, we're not going to get into that. Um, the king uh, in love with the slave, there's, there's one right at the end which is even more extraordinary but uh, I, I'll end up running out of time if I tell you that one. But what we see, and this is very characteristic of the tradition, this lover-beloved uh, relationship between the human person and God. Is it strong in the Quran itself? No. The Quran is not, is not uh, like this. But remember what we said about pretext and context Many people read the Quran and they will see it only takes one verse and that verse about they will love him and he will love them uh, and a few other snippets about that, that goes down to depths, infinite depths beneath the surface and it gives rise to a whole tradition of love poetry which is not simply high culture. Uh, this this kind of love poetry, which is very erotic in its way, uh, is part of very ordinary culture. Even today in, in, in Pakistan, when I lived there, people would have these poetry competitions, ghazal competitions, uh, and it's this style of poetry, the, the unrequited love, always playing on this, the ambiguity between human love and divine love. So. I hope I didn't give you the sense by giving you those, those small selections from the Quran that uh, the tradition is, is empty of this, this kind of love mysticism. In fact, I think you'd, you'd probably have to say it is much more common in the, in the popular culture uh, of Muslim countries than, than perhaps it is in the popular culture of Christian countries. I've got through two questions now. <laughs> this one's from Greg. Thank you, Greg. Uh, you said in the course of your presentation this morning, that was yesterday morning, I think, uh, for Christians, Jesus is the touchstone by which we judge any other claim to be the self-expression of God. That's an accurate quotation, thank you. Um, isn't this what makes Jews, Muslims, and adherents of other faiths mad as hell? Uh, and then there's a little note, side note which says, not that they don't do the same thing with other touchstones. Uh, perhaps you could clarify, elaborate. Uh, I, I think you've already put your, your finger on the, on the point, Greg, and that, that is each religious tradition has a touchstone. Uh, if you come along to someone and say, uh, he, this, this is the self-revelation of God. It's, I know it's completely opposite to what you, what you believe is the self-revelation of God, but it really is because it says it is. You know, what are you going to make of that? Every, every person of faith, because they have made a commitment to some, uh, some understanding of God, because they have made a commitment to God within the understanding of a certain community on the basis of the witness of a certain community, has uh, a kind of criterion by which they can see in other places, yes, that same truth emerging. Uh, Paul's question this morning about, about the Hindu gentleman, uh, how, do we, how do we judge whether there's something genuine there, whether this might be the work of God in some way? Do we see, we judge it by the, the touchstone, by the by criterion uh, 
of the love we see manifest in the cross. We, we, can't, we can't survive without some kind of criterion. And as you note in, in, in your note, everybody has one. Should it make us mad as hell? Uh, it doesn't make me mad that, that Muslims have a different criterion for what constitutes the truth about God than I do. Uh, I know very well that, that many Muslims will, will look at the Christian tradition and say, yes, I recognize that, yes, I, because I have this criterion, in fact, criterion is one of the names that is given to the Quran, uh, because I have this criterion, I can recognize the truth and the goodness in, in these other places. And the Quran is, can be very pluralistic in lots of ways because it's, it's said in the, the Islamic tradition that there were 124,000 prophets. Uh, God has sent prophets to every people in every time. So if you find something which sounds familiar, uh, in, in the Buddha's teaching, then you do as some Japanese Muslims would. They say, well, Buddha was one of, one of God's prophets. So therefore, of course, he said these things which, which sound very similar to, to the Quran. Uh, so there is no criterionless space. Um, I, th I, think, I think that's not true just in religion. It's, it's true in aesthetics and and various other ways. Um, so I, I, one, of, one of the difficulties, I think, in, in a lot of interfaith work is that people uh, are often expected, and it, it's considered to be kind of good citizenship in the interfaith world, to, to leave your criteria at the door and just take whatever, whatever is said. Well, that's your truth, this is my truth. Uh, you think that God, you think that God hates uh, gays. I don't think that God hates gays. That's fine. That's your truth. This is my truth. Uh, you know, we, we do it at the level of theology. Sometimes we just sort of separate it out. Oh, God has got several different projects, and God, you know, God tried a thing over here, which was fine for Chinese people. Uh, tried a thing here, which was good for Indian people. But he found this other thing, which really works well in Europe and North America. Um, or South America too, even better. Uh, no, the, the idea that God has various different projects which all have different criteria about what is really real and really true, I, I don't think, uh, well, I can't believe it. Uh, it's, it would be like saying, it, because the, the thing is, we don't live in silos. It would be fine if, if uh, these, if, it were, if these were different planets and we were not actually interacting with one another. But people often talk about these various different ways up the same mountain, you know, and it doesn't matter which path you take, you'll get there. And, yeah, well, you know, you can see a, a certain conventional wisdom to that, but that's not the way we live in this world. We, it, it's, uh, it would be like saying, uh, the people in Liechtenstein uh, have decided that uh, they are going to have clean air and it needs to be done this way and the you know, electricity generation will be done that way and the speed limit will be such and such and the emissions controls will be this. Well, you know, they're, they're surrounded by other people. It's not enough to say, oh, Germany says, well, no, we're going to do it differently. We, it, it's fine by us. We share the same air. We're not, it's not just that we're on different tracks and we overlap occasionally and exchange travelers' tales at the, at the crossroads and then go off on our journey. We're living in the same world. And our, our, our beliefs uh, determine how we, how we live in the world, how we treat the earth, how we treat other people. Our religious beliefs affect how we, uh, how we do our politics. They affect precisely. I mean, you take the case of take the case of Iraq. You might say, "Oh, well, okay, they're Christians. That's fine. That's that's the Christian way of seeing it, and this is the Sunni way of seeing it, and this is the Shia way of seeing it." And so, uh, they're just separate. They're just different. They're not. We, we they have to live in the same space. We we 
we live beside one another, we're not just passing, uh, passing by. So the, what we consider to be the truth about God and the universe and the earth and God's, God's attitude to people and the, the, what really constitutes human flourishing, that matters enormously to everybody else even if they don't share our faith. And so there is an argument to be had. It's not simply good enough to say, okay, uh, I'm, I'm a Christian and I believe this and I believe you know, in that. Uh, you, can, you can believe something entirely different though you live next door to me. It might be all right at the level of you know, metaphysics and so on, but when it comes to, to practical things about respect for other people, about freedoms, uh, about modesty, about any number of things, there's a, there's a discussion to be had because we affect one another. We're living on the same planet. So I'm not, uh, I'm not a great believer in the sort of criterionless space, um, which doesn't mean it has to be polemical, but it means uh, it's real, you know. Uh, it's like, it, it should be like any town meeting in a way. It should be real about what really matters, uh, about how we manage to live together in spite of our, our different beliefs, and whether certain beliefs about people are, are tolerable or not. Okay, that's three. Whatever happened to the beautiful reading of John's prologue at the end of Mass? It's gone. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, when, when they read John's prologue at the end of Mass uh, in, in the old rite, uh, you didn't actually hear it anyway, so it wasn't doing you much good. But um, I, would love to, I would love to have John's prologue return to its, to its rightful place. I mean, we get it on uh, one of the Masses at Christmas, and I think on New Year's Day it comes around again. But uh, as you can tell, I love to preach on John's prologue, so I would bring it back at the end of every Mass uh, and add another sermon. <laughs> Sorry about the paper, that's what it says. <laughs> now the question. Um, th this is a question about what, what I said about Ehl al-Kalam, uh, the people of the word, the people of God's speech, and human channels. And the questioner asks, uh, isn't there a sense in which the community of believers, the body of Christ, is also a human channel? Uh, and I think that's quite right. Uh, I think, perhaps I, I alluded to it a bit too, too briefly uh, yesterday morning. I think it's true, Mary is the human channel through which the incarnation begins. But as I said, I, uh, the church becomes the embodiment of Christ, the continuing embodiment of Christ. And so the, the continuation of the incarnation uh, do we give birth to Jesus in quite the same way? Not exactly. Um, are, we, are we the the mother of the incarnation? Not exactly, but uh, so we have a slightly different role from Mary. We're not the, the human channel in the same way, uh, but it is, it is very real, it is very human. I was talking to Lawrence about this this afternoon actually, and uh, we were talking about this notion of the mystical body. And uh, I remember when I was a novice, uh, the, the assistant novice master used to rail against the idea of the mystical body. He said, not mystical, it's real. Uh, it used to be uh, earlier in our tradition, some centuries ago, that the mystical body of Christ referred to the Eucharist. but. Uh, particularly in more recent times, and Pius XII wrote an encyclical called Mystici Corporis, uh, of the mystical body. We've started to talk about the church as the mystical body of Christ, which kind of makes it, you know, a bit, you know, with all due respect to mystics, uh, it, it disembodies it a, a bit. Uh, it doesn't take seriously what Paul uh, says in his letters about the body of Christ and the embodiedness uh, and our relation to one another in the body. So, uh, 
Thank you for that question. I, I, I think it, it's quite right that the, the body of Christ um, continues to be, uh, continues the, the incarnation in a certain sense to the extent that we are the body of Christ. But it also gives us, I suppose, now that I think of it, uh, perhaps a bit of an understanding of why, why they talk about Mary as the mother of the church. Uh, if the church is the body of Christ, um, and Mary gave birth to Christ, then there is a certain sense in which uh, she is that human channel through which this whole thing got going. And so her, her transparency to the word, her accepting of the word and allowing the word to take flesh in her uh, is what makes us who we are. She's often... Um, one of one of the uh, pieces of uh, uh, one of the PDF files I put up for you on the web um, is a, is an article I wrote about Mary and Muhammad um, as as bearers of the word, and uh, they they have this parallel. I mentioned a couple of them yesterday, but another one is the the ideal believer. I mean, we don't know very much about Mary. Uh, we think we know a lot more about Muhammad. There's a lot more said about him, certainly. Uh, but they, are both, they both play this role of the, the ideal believer, precisely because they are both uh, so intimate with the word. There is no one that has a more intimate connection to the word than the one who gave flesh to it. There is no one who has a more intimate uh, connection to the word of God spoken in, in the Quran than the one who received the recitations and, and handed them on. So it's that intimacy with the word which makes them the, the ideal of the, of the believer, of the disciple. When I attend the, I, I, this comes from, coming from Sydney, when I read this, when I attend the opera house at the local mosque, when I attend the open house at the, the local mosque, they make a big deal about how you can trust the authenticity of the Quran because it is never translated, only the original Arabic. But obviously it has been translated. Can you explain my disconnect here? Um, what, you, what you heard, you probably heard correctly, people do say that kind of thing all the time. Uh, they will... Again, it, it comes down to this, this uh, game of prophets and books, which I was trying to avoid by, by saying, let's take the word as our common term. Because they will say, for example, well, it, it's not that the Quran has never been translated, but that the original is still available. Now, uh, Muslims would say that the original gospel is not still available. We have four claimants to be gospel um, in the canonical scriptures and then there are lots of other gospels claiming to be gospel none of them is actually claiming to be the the text that jesus brought uh, because that's that's a misunderstanding we, we don't think of jesus in the christian tradition as the one who brought the book of the gospels although If you, if you look at this, and, and this is very characteristic of Eastern iconography, it would not be surprising if people thought of Jesus as the bringer of a book. Because wherever you go uh, in, among the Eastern churches and you look at the iconography, Jesus is always carrying a book. The apostles are carrying books. If they don't have books, they have scrolls. It's not surprising at all that we were considered to be people of the book. But we are not people of the book, we are people of the word. So uh, Muslims would say Jesus spoke Aramaic, whatever he was preaching, he was not preaching in Greek. You don't have the words of Jesus. You, you have a Greek translation of them and most of you don't read Greek, so therefore you are relying on other translations. Muslims certainly rely on translations of the Quran, even if you're an Arab, uh, you will very often rely on what we call a paraphrastic commentary, a paraphrase of the Quran to help you with the, 
the meaning of some unusual words. Hardly anyone is, is simply taking the text of the Quran uh, without any help from dictionaries, from the tradition which has asked itself, what does this word mean? What does that word mean? How are we to understand this? So it's a bit of a false comparison to say that on the one hand you've got a text which is absolutely pristine. It certainly, it, the text has almost changed not at all since the earliest time. We have good evidence of that now, uh, very recent evidence, but or recently discovered evidence, so it's old evidence. But uh, on the other hand, it's a misunderstanding of what the Gospels are to worry about whether it's in Greek or Aramaic or, or whatever. And, and that's why we need to, to keep in mind not to be drawn into that competition of books, because books are not the thing. It's the word that we have in common. It's the belief that God is a speaker and communicating to us. So, uh, what's, the, what's the sacred language of Christians? Flesh, thank you. <laughs> Body language. It doesn't matter that we don't have the Aramaic of Jesus. It doesn't matter. Uh, whether it was a good Greek translation or a bad Greek translation. The sacred language uh, in which God has spoken to us is in the, in the body language of flesh. And it means also for us that, that if we are going to proclaim the gospel, which comes to us in body language, we have to proclaim it in the same language. Uh, it's not good enough to simply to be able to read it out in Greek and say, there you are, there it is. The, the, uh, the question is, can we so resonate with that word which was in the flesh in Jesus that it is in our flesh as well, that we embody it as the body of Christ. So preaching, preaching is not preaching unless we're preaching in the sacred language of Christianity and that sacred language is <laughs> I heard various answers then. Body, okay, well, like so. body, flesh. I could, there could be a whole lecture on the distinction between body, flesh, spirit and Paul, but uh, that's a whole other issue. Those were the new questions, these are the old ones. Okay. This one this one's a complex question. Um, I'm not quite sure how to, how to approach it. Uh, it it's referring to the, the, uh, what I said about the cross, the premise of the cross, God doesn't practice self-defense. Therefore, a literal act to be practiced literally, a literal act to be lived metaphorically, how can or would practicing this literally on the world stage play out in our town, protecting our family, it's, it's one of the huge questions for, for Christians. How does the non-violence of God, how does the disarmed nature of divine love play out for us in a world which is very broken? We, we saw what happened, so, uh, you remember I, I mentioned the, the educated Persian who was talking to the, to the Byzantine emperor in uh, Benedict's favorite book, uh, he says, you know, if you behave that way, if you, if you behave in a, uh, in a non-violent way, if you turn the other cheek, if you give without any hope of return, if you do all these things, people are just going to land on you like vultures. And it's true. Uh, I don't have the answer to this question, but it, it has to remain a question mark for us. How, how can we transform the world into a place where we can be disarmed? How do you go about disarming? How do you go about uh, creating sufficient trust that one doesn't require being armed to the teeth to go to school? How can you build the kind of trust between nations where we don't have to spend huge percentages of our gross national product 
on worthless machinery of war. And if you think India and Pakistan have spent such a huge amount of money arming themselves against each other, for the most part they've hardly used it, but they've, they've wasted, wasted trillions, trillions of dollars in these, what is it, nearly 60 years since, since they were, uh, since they became independent, just being armed against one another. Meanwhile, people live in poverty. Meanwhile, the military on both sides has a great interest in, in keeping control of this. The political class has a great interest in keeping an enemy and a threat. How do we go about translating that disarmed nature of the cross, which um, this our nature of, of the love of God shown in the cross into our world. Many pe better people have thought about this and, and written about it than um, better people than, than me. So, but it is a movement. It remains a question for us. We cannot, as Christians, simply accept uh, the status quo where so much of our energy goes into preparation for violence or preparation against violence, which, as we know, just breeds and escalates uh, mutual violence, while much of, much of Africa is starving, much of Africa is, is getting embroiled in the whole thing as well. This is, this is the nature of sin. Our world is, is sunken in sin in, in, in so many respects. So it's not simply a case of an individual saying, Oh, well, Jesus is like that, I'm, I'm not going to. Some, some people will. But, but the bigger question is how can we do this as communities and how do we create uh, communities and nations where, where violence is consistently reduced because there is justice, uh, where there is not this um, antagonism because there's competition for scarce resources because resources are shared uh, where there is not this antagonism because of long histories of fighting over over territory these things can be resolved but there are many aspects of our, of our culture and our economy which don't really want them resolved because resolving them would fundamentally change things for us so the question of pacifism and, and the cross is, is one which uh, should continue to, to niggle at us, uh, but I, I don't pretend to give you the answer to that question. Don't worry, we, we will be doing more questions tomorrow morning when Lawrence will. Uh, Muslims place a great importance on the garden as a, as a glimpse into paradise, that's true. Uh, can you please comment on their vision of paradise and compare their vision with ours. Um, there are various visions of paradise, uh, even in the Islamic tradition, um, even in the Quran. What is, what is the key aspect of paradise that, that the Muslim tradition would, um, would focus on? It is the mutual pleasure of God, that God is pleased with you and you are pleased with God. That's, that's the great success. If, there can, if you can arrive at that, at that place where you are happy with God and God is happy with you, that's it. Of course, there are metaphors of gardens and springs and uh, in the Christian tradition, we have the metaphor of the banquet and the mountain on which there is no more war and the, the wolf lies down with the lamb and the the ox with the tiger and the, the child plays over the viper's lair and yes I mean we, we have our metaphors for for what the end time is like uh, but in the Islamic tradition I think the heart of it is is that sense of uh, being happy with one another it's not the same um, not the same vision of uniting with God, being brought into the unity of the divine life. There's always this sense still of, of separateness. Uh, 
there was a lot of discussion in the Islamic tradition about whether people will ever be able to actually see God. Uh, the Quran talks about seeing God, but people say, well, that, that can't be right, you know, because God is not corporeal. You can't see what is not corporeal because seeing is about eyes. And, but fundamentally, I think that that sense of being satisfied, uh, God with you and, and you with God, uh, which echoes this, uh, the, love, the love poetry that, uh, that I spoke of before. I thought Islam was a very strict monotheism, but the pronoun used for God is the plural we. Please explain. Um, it's usually said that this is the, what they call the, uh, the plural of majesty. Uh, you people wouldn't know about it because you have rejected legitimate royal authority. <laughs> You like to call your leaders Mr. President or uh, perhaps soon Ms. President. Uh, you don't like that business, but Queen Victoria and sometimes Queen Elizabeth and, and other, other royalty speak in the plural, and the popes did too. Um, uh, most, most don't, haven't recently, but they, but they do from time to time, and, and in formal letters certainly they write in the plural. Uh, so this is, not, this is not saying there's more than one God. It's simply considered to be the plural of majesty. We have it in Genesis, of course, too. Uh, uh, God says, let us, let us make uh, humanity in our own likeness after our image, and so on. And the rabbis were very worried about this. They said, well, what, what, is this what is this we? Who is God talking to? And uh, some of them said, well, God is talking to the, to the elements from which the human person will be made. You know, God is talking to the earth. God is talking to the air, saying, let us together, talking to the water, let us together make the human person. Others said, no, God is talking to the angels. Uh, and it, in something, it, it's not in Genesis, it's, it's in the Talmud, but you get the, not the, in, it's in the, the Midrash. Um, you get these stories of God, the, the rabbi said, well, God, God asked the angels, what will, um, you know, what, what about if I create human beings? And, uh, and the angels said, oh, no, you wouldn't want to do that. I mean, that's an awful idea, which is exactly what they say in the Quran, uh, as you saw yesterday. The, this, is, this is in the, the Midrash. And uh, so God destroys them. And he creates a new group of angels. He says, I've been thinking about creating human beings. Uh, and they say, oh, no, that's an awful idea. I wouldn't do that if I were you. He destroys them and creates a third group of angels. He says, I've been thinking create about, uh, about creating human beings. What do you think of that? They say, look, you do what you like. <laughs> you know? The other, you, you destroyed the others because they disagreed. You do what you like. We're not going to get into that. But that's that's in, the, uh, in the rabbinic literature. And, and it comes out again in the Quran. But it was, that, that story was prompted by this same question. What's, what's the we doing there? Who, who is God talking to? Father Lawrence mentioned in one of his talks that Jesus said religion can become a block to God. Chapter and verse, please. <laughs> what would a Muslim say about Jesus' statement? Uh, Jesus didn't quite put it that way, but uh, um, yes, that's what he meant, it seems. Uh, I think Muslims would say, yes, that's, that is true in a way, because religion, and, and Jesus would agree with them, religion can start to be changed by, by people. You, you set up your own institutions, there's a line in the Quran where God is talking about the Christians and he says, uh, oh, monasticism, they invented that for themselves. I didn't command it, they invented that for themselves. Uh, not that it's necessarily a bad thing, but they didn't, they didn't observe it rightly. You have monks, you know, sort of traveling all over the world instead of staying in their monasteries. And things like that. God didn't command monasticism, uh, humans, and, 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 and the Quran says they did it to please God, but they didn't observe it rightly. So 
uh, the Quran knows this notion of, uh, of people developing religious systems and, and ideas and so on, which actually in the end can get in the way of the relationship with God. Uh, certainly, uh, the Islamic tradition would, would be, uh, yes, many Muslims are critical of, of the Christian tradition because they say, well, we don't have this intermediary business. You know, you don't have the sacraments and all that kind of thing. You know, the, the individual believer is, has an immediate relationship with God. Uh, repentance and forgiveness are immediate. You know, this business of confession and all that kind of thing that, you know, you've created something which actually puts a block between you and God. So, uh, I think Muslims would agree. Overall, though, uh, the Islamic tradition sees religion as something which is given by God. Uh, religion is something which is revealed. Uh, in the Catholic tradition where we have a bet both ways on this, um, we tend, in official documentation, we tend to treat uh, particularly non-Abrahamic religions, uh, and also Islam too probably, in the official line as these are the result of the human search for God. Humans have been searching for God and so they have developed these scriptures and rituals and beliefs and so on. Um, but real religion, the truth, is given by God. It's not, it's not developed by humans, it's, it's, it's on God's initiative. And uh, the Islamic tradition would certainly agree. Uh, the, the University of Al-Azhar, the famous seat of Sunni learning in, uh, in Cairo, has this department for the dialogue of what they call heavenly religions. Uh, by which they mean religions that have been sent down from heaven. al adiyan al samawiyya which I, I, I kind of object to um, because I don't think religion is revealed. I, I, think, I think you admit that religion, religion develops, you know, we, we develop forms of worship and, and styles of prayer and rituals and, and various other things uh, out of our communal response towards, uh, our, our communal response to God's initiative and revelation. But I don't think God reveals religious systems. I think God, in the Christian tradition, we would say God reveals God's self. Uh, what we call religion, those activities and, uh, and structures and so on, are part of our responding to what God has, uh, what God has revealed. And as, as Lawrence quite rightly says, they can be a problem. They can actually, we can create things which, which make it more difficult. Uh, and, we, you know, we, we all grew up Catholic, or most of us grew up Catholic, didn't we? Um, you know how some of these things help and, and some really hurt. This one I couldn't quite understand. But, um, is, there, is there a feminine nature attributed to God in the Quran or in Muslim culture? Interesting question. Uh, the Quran would never use a feminine pronoun of God uh, any more than, than the Bible really does, although the in the biblical tradition, we have the the image as as a mother, as a mother gathers her children, and so on. We we have very maternal images of God, although we don't use she usually of God. Uh, I mentioned before uh, Sarah Maitland um, in her wonderful book, The Big Enough God. Uh, Sarah Maitland insists. She says, well, I'm not going to give up the word Father because that's the word Jesus reserved for God. I would rather try and stop everybody else using the term Father than to stop using the term Jesus used for God. But nonetheless, she says, I, I'm going to change the pronouns. So she says, uh, you know, when the Father gathers her children, just to, <laughs> to break us out of that gendered sense, she says, I don't want to give up the word because that was Jesus' word. Uh, but I'm going, to, I'm going to wrong foot you for a moment by saying her. Uh, in the Quran, um, I, I think, I think uh, one way of uh, 
uh, of broaching this, this question is, you know, the key terms that are used of God, the key names of God, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the merciful, the compassionate, uh, they're, they're both uh, based on the three letters R, H, and M. Uh, and those three letters, the noun that comes from those three letters is the noun for the womb. Uh, and so one might say, and many people do, that, that these fundamental attributes of God, according, according to the Quran, these fundamental attributes of, of compassion and mercy are in one sense very feminine. They are uh, that kind of intimate, intimate feeling God has that, that, as the biblical tradition would say, as a mother, um, a mother cannot forget her baby at the breast. So does the Quran have uh, a feminine, uh, does it attribute a feminine nature to God? Not exactly, but um, the, these two great attributes of God, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, are in their way very feminine. What is a good and inexpensive version of the Quran I could buy? Uh, <coughs> the Oxford, Oxford paperback, quite a good translation. Um, there, there are two, two approaches to this. One is to say, get, get, get a Quran by all means. And the, the Oxford classics version is, is fine by Abdul Halim. Um, but Usually I said, if people, if you're going to get that kind of Quran, start at the back. Start with chapter 1, and then go to chapter 114, 113, 112, and work your way to chapter 2. Uh, the Islamic tradition would tell us that probably you're closer to a, a chronological order if you do it that way. We don't know exactly what the, what the ordering principle is in the Quran, but it doesn't claim to be chronological, and it doesn't have a narrative structure. It seems as though the longest, apart from the, the prayer that opens it, it seems that the longest chapters are at the beginning and they gradually get smaller till the end when you've just got a few lines and each line only has a couple of words in it sometimes. So uh, I, sometime, I sometimes say to people, start at 1, then go 114, 113, because the, f the, end, the stuff down the end is really punchy. It's very... Uh, it's very prophetic. It's it's you can. It's very dramatic. Uh, it's full of it's full of movement and and, and pithy statement. Uh, whereas, if you get into to Surah two and three and so on, uh, there's a lot of legislation. You've got some verses are very long, and you know there's in Surah two you've got this verse about you know, if you happen to be on a journey and you enter into a contract, which you know, this one should write and that one should do, and you get a scribe, and but if there's no scribe, and, you know you don't want to be reading that. Um, and you know I, I think as, as as Christians, you know the if if you said to someone, well, if you want, do you want to understand Christianity? Well, uh, you know here's the Bible. Start at start at Genesis and work your way through, and then by the time people are uh, halfway through Leviticus, they've <laughs> given up any idea of, uh, of possibly understanding what this is about. So um, that's one way of approaching it. Get a standard Quran and read it backwards. Uh, not just because it's in Arabic, but <clears throat> uh, the other way, th there is, a, uh, I, th I think I mentioned the other day, uh, Kenneth Cragg uh, readings from the Quran. What Craig has done, he's done his own translation. He's a, he's a wonderful scholar of English, or was. He died uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, almost made it to his 100th birthday, not quite. Uh, but he has, he has organized it thematically, which in a sense is not true to the Quran because the Quran doesn't come that way. But the Quran, the Quran lives orally and the Quran lives in people's memory. And, and people remember it thematically, even if they don't, uh, even if they don't, it doesn't appear in the book thematically. Uh, so I, I quite like that approach. Uh, you'll find it a little easier to get into because he says, you know, the, okay, these are the themes about the praise of God and, and so on. These are the themes about the stories of the prophets. You'll get a better feel for the mindset of the Quran and, and some of its style 
while at the same time it's not, it's not as the Quran was. I put in that, uh, that box file uh, on the web for you um, a chapter of mine that I did for, for uh, Dennis's wife, Jane, uh, edited the Cambridge Companion to the Quran. And uh, I did the chapter on, called Themes and Topics. Very uh, pedestrian title, but there was Themes and Topics of the Quran. And uh, it's, it's a relatively short chapter, I think about 5,000 words. Uh, but it tells you, really, it gives you a presentation of the, th the themes in the Quran. Uh, and I, I use, as the organizing principle, I use the names of God. Uh, so, because the Quran really is, it's not, not just spoken by God, but God is the subject in, that, in the sense of the speaker, but also the topic. So you can read it there. Uh, yep, we're out of time. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna ask questions because the questions are here. Well, I got, I got through this fistful. So, uh, thank you, we've got, uh, oh, we're gonna get about three questions left and, and as many that, as Lawrence can think of tomorrow morning. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think